Pay close attention. The news you are about to see is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you news as it relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Israel Hawkins, where we're seeing some great extremes in the weather taking place right now. On one hand, we have extreme uh, rain and flooding. On another hand, we have extreme drought, and of course, that's affecting the agriculture. And then we also have in the news uh, President Duterte in the Philippines, who has actually thrown out a challenge to anyone who can prove to him that God actually hmm. exists. First, we're going to start off in Japan, where more than 100 people have been killed and many more are not accounted for in the worst flooding that has occurred in 35 years. Search and rescue, eff rescue efforts excuse me, continue in southwestern Japan, looking for survivors trapped in homes due to flooding and mudslides. At times, the rain fell in torrents with as much as three inches per hour falling. Even though the rains have now subsided from the weekend, temperatures are forecasted to be in the 90s. And of course, there are fears of heat stroke as many people are left homeless and some of those people are elderly. Well, Japan seems to be getting more than its desired share of water. Here in the U.S., the fourth largest river, the Rio Grande, is drying up. In what was uh, once a bed of flowing river, conservationist Thomas Archdeacon drives a UTV on the now dry riverbed. Now the river usually only dries out in the middle of summer, but was parched in the middle of spring. Archdeacon said that there's been less snowpack from the Colorado mountains and less water over the long run. Hydrologists have diverted water flow to people in need and to farms and towns. Uh, one farmer, Nick Carrasco, is on the waiting list behind other farmers for water to his crops, to water his crops. Now, he says his property borders the river, and he worries that they may actually run out of water before they get to him. And he, of course, has to wait for the next go-round before he can get the water, much-needed water, to water his crops. And I can't imagine what it would be like being on a waiting list to get water, a, a vital, you know, something needed for life, and you're on a waiting list. And not only uh, just to be able to water his crops, but that provides his livelihood mm -hmm. as well. So it's got to be very difficult. Well, Derek Lente, who sits on the Water and Natural Resources Committee, said that people used to pump water from the ground, and now they pump it directly from the river. When asked why he thought that was the case, he said it's cheaper, better, mm -hmm. and they need the water to wash their Mercedes. Well, many believe the towns are using more water from the river than before too much. Now, the population in the valley has doubled in the past 30 years, and the, that population now isn't concerned with water conservation. Mm, well, they say the old saying, they won't miss the water until the well runs dry. Until it's gone. Well, although there are conservation efforts, those efforts might not be enough. Average temperatures have risen a degree and a half in the region over the last 20 years. Well, Iraq's Diwani province is also experiencing drought conditions as well. Now, fields lie empty because of lack of water. An unusually harsh drought has caused the agricultural ministry to suspend the production of rice, corn, and other cereals. Now, one farmer among many who was furious over the decision said, do they want us to die? We want the rice and vegetables. What are we supposed to beg in the streets? Are we supposed to beg in the streets, he said? Farmers say their lives depend on agriculture. Hmm. The government says that it will compensate farmers, particularly rice producers, but many fear that promise will not be kept, jeopardizing a long tradition and compromising a much needed staple food used across the country. So they're apparently very dependent on not only the growth of rice for their own consumption, but also as a commodity to sell to other people as well. Well, Raqqa was once a thriving city, but after ISIS came and the U.S.-led coalition chased them there, 
The coalition leveled 90% of the city. Mm. Now, locals are picking up the pieces and have been for years. One of the worst things there are the bodies. Hundreds, thousands rotting under the rubble in sweltering heat. Now, people from all walks of life, including rebels, civilians, and soldiers, buried under, under the debris, waiting to be removed and buried. And that's not really, that's not the first time we've uh, talked about a, a city like that where that smell of mm -hmm. death just mm -hmm. permeates uh, everything. They said it's nothing like you've ever smelled right. before, but uh, to have that many bodies rotting, uh, I can only imagine after 90% of the uh, city is gone what that must be like. Yeah, and then the guys like uh, Mr. Assad here, whose job it is to actually find those bodies, dig yeah. them out in the sweltering heat, retrieve them so that they can be properly disposed of or buried, sure. which they have, uh, as we're going to talk about here, some mass graves. Assad al Masuj uh, and his team, they actually have this job of digging up bodies day after day using pickaxes and shovels to bury them in mass graves. Now, he was going to school for a medical degree, but never completed that. His experience now has made him a pathologist in just several uh, hours, they dig up about 80 bodies. Now, he's been at this for over seven months, and his hope is that the city will give them more equipment and gear to do their jobs. They're understaffed, they're underfunded. He said a city like Raqqa actually should have more resources to carry out the task of, of, of burying the dead and, and, and cleaning up the rubble, but they don't. And after all that has occurred in Raqqa, the international community has remained silent, and no one has even lent a helping hand. That's one of the effects you see of war. What once was a thriving city now becomes reduced to basically a pile of rubbles, almost inhabitable because, uh, you know, everything is destroyed. Yep, totally desolate. Well, even the Americans have said that no one will ever know how many people have died in Raqqa. Wow. Well, Duterte is in the news, yet once again angering the Catholic Church and Christians worldwide with his latest challenge. He said... He'd quit if someone could prove to him that God exists. Uh, he has in the past defied the Catholic Church on many topics, sometimes even using explicitives or expl expletives in his speeches concerning them. Now, many want to know, is it worth taking him up on this challenge or just ignore him? Also, what will be the Catholic Church's response, if any? Well, oil has been a hot topic in the Middle East and continues to be. This time, Libya is in the news uh, actually receiving a little bit of pressure regarding their oil. Mm. Our, our field correspondent Larry McGee has the story. Larry, who is, uh, who is putting the pressure on Libya and what is Libya planning on doing? For years, the lifeblood of the global economy has been oil. And over the course of the last few years, there has been a lot of human bloodshed in an effort to keep it that way. In oil-rich Libya, reputed warlord Khalifa Haftar has turned over control of key oil export terminals in the nation, citing his country's best interests as the cause. Commentators argue that international pressure coming from the UK, the United States, France, and others had a strong part to play in the decision. After fighting it out with local competitors for control of the terminals, Mr. Haftar then delivered them to the country's National Oil Corporation in Tripoli. The vice president of Libya's presidential council, Ahmed Makti, gave a televised congratulations to all Libyans for resuming oil exportation and offered his thanks in hopes that the restart will be profitable for everyone. The leader also commended those whom he believes acted rationally and labored on the side of reason to end the crisis. In the area extending from Tripoli to Benghazi, the country is reported to have over 45 billion barrels in oil reserves, in addition to large amounts of gas in three of the nation's largest oil fields. The region also houses five of the country's major ports, including Sidra, which is reported to export 400,000 barrels per day, and Ras Lanouf, which exports 220,000. Money and economics is also at the root of major conflicts elsewhere. President Trump is making headlines this week after confronting Germany at a recent NATO summit 
over collaboration with Russia on a resource deal. The president says Germany is being held captive because of the agreement, which delivers natural gas from Russia to Germany through the Nord Stream pipeline. Up until now, the issue is reported to have been a matter for the sidelines and has never enjoyed official discussion at NATO since the organization is said to strive to keep business separate from security. President Trump is thought by some analysts to be motivated by the desire to increase American sales of gas to Europe and particularly to have Germany drop its deal with Russia and re-sign with the U.S. In a bid to gain his way, the president is employing other tactics as well, subtly implying that unless certain conditions are met, the U.S. might refrain from offering its military support towards the protection of certain nations. This, analysts say, is a red line since Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty is held as the bedrock of the accord, which basically commits each member state to consider an armed attack against one member state as an armed attack against them all. For YPN News, I'm Larry McGee. It's Anja. Back to you. Well, the United States is definitely not pleased with Germany maintaining its course of doing business with Russia regarding this natural gas pipeline. Well, Donald Trump has already been accused of imposing trade policies that could harm the U.S. and its allies, but now he threatens to do even more. In a recent meeting with the Dutch Prime Minister, the president told reporters, we're not planning anything now, but if they don't treat us properly, we will be doing something. Well, the they Mr. Trump was referring to is the World Trade Organization, also referred to as the WTO. His comments came after a report by the Axios news website, which said Trump's administration has drafted proposed legislation which would allow Trump to raise tariffs at will and negotiate special uh, special tariff rates with specific countries. Now, both of these are basic violations of the WTO rules. Hmm. Initially, the U.S. made the first move in this trade issue by imposing tariffs on steel and aluminum. Now, Washington may possibly do the same thing with foreign-made vehicles and auto parts which are imported regardless of the warnings that this could directly hurt America's car industry. Not to mention, it could also lead to countermeasures by some of America's top trading partners who would be affected as well. One such partner is Germany. This week, Chancellor Angela Merkel predicted a trade war on the horizon if there is no de-escalation. She told German lawmakers, we have tariffs on aluminum and steel, and it appears cars, too, will be imposed with tariffs when they're imported into the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, she said, this has the character of a trade conflict. But the trade conflict didn't begin with America's European allies and the Chinese are not backing down. With the latest round of $34 billion in U.S. tariffs, the Chinese Foreign Ministry has said as long as the United States issues a so-called tariff list, China will take necessary measures to firmly protect its legitimate interests. Well, the U.S.'s trading partners, including the European Union, China, and Japan, have all taken their concerns to the WTO. There is real cause for their concern because the rules-based global trading system they are all very familiar with could collapse under the current conditions. Hmm. Susan Aronson from the Institute for International Economic Policy told Al Jazeera, in general, people want trade to be under a set of rules so that there's certainty and predictability. And what Trump has done has totally undermined the system. So it's not just what he's actually put in place, it's what he's threatened to do and what that does to trust. But the president doesn't seem too concerned about maintaining that trust and has even mentioned the possibility of pulling out of the World Trade Organization, which would change the status quo that has been operating for well over half a century. Wow. Well, never has hope and reconciliation been more needed. I know I share a desire with all of you and your neighbors for just and lasting peace. Well, those words were spoken by Prince William as he addressed an Israeli audience this week, which included Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife. 
Now, the princess traveled to the region for a tour on both sides of the fence, lasting four days. While it was said that the visit would be non-political, Prince William did not only meet with the Prime Minister, but sat down and talked with the President of Israel and is scheduled to visit the West Bank, where he will be greeted by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Knowing the prince would cross the border into occupied Palestine the following day, President Rivlin asked if he would deliver a message of peace to President Abbas on his behalf. President Rivlin also told the Duke of Cambridge that he was writing a new page in history. This is the first time ever for any royal to have officially visited the nation of Israel. This is a very big deal to Israel and for sure no ordinary royal visit. Well, another very big deal for Israelis and Palestinians is talk of a new peace plan. President Trump's senior advisor, Jared Kushner, in an exclusive interview with Al Quds, a Palestinian newspaper, explained that Trump is ready and willing to work with President Abbas to find a peace plan both sides can agree to. For some time now, the White House has been saying they have a plan to solve the international or the Palestinian, excuse me, Israeli conflict. However, President Abbas has refused to talk with them ever since Mr. Trump made his controversial announcement recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, while at the same time moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Al Quds reported Mr. Kushner as saying, they want to see a deal that respects the dignity of the Palestinians and puts an actual solution to the issues that have been discussed for decades. They all insist the Alaska Mosque should continue to be open to all Muslims who wish to pray there. Well, Pope Francis is also talking about Middle East peace. On Saturday, the Pope will pray for peace in the region. He will meet with Catholic patriarchs of Eastern churches and representatives of Orthodox churches. Cardinal Leonardo Sandri, who's organizing the visit, and Cardinal Kurt Cook, who is coordinating with the Orthodox churches, spoke of the upcoming visit at the Vatican. Cardinal Leonardo said, We hope that those responsible for the world situation, especially those in these regions, will listen to this prayer. It may indirectly touch their consciences so they don't follow force or violence, but look for a political solution. Hmm. Cardinal Kurt Koch uh, added, the Catholic Church wants all Eastern churches and all Orthodox churches to be present because they're all concerned about the situation of Christians in Syria and the Middle East. Well, representatives and leaders of 19 churches along with the Pope will attend, first praying together for peace and then meeting behind closed doors to discuss the situation in the Middle East. Although all those living in the region suffer the consequences of the violence, it has provoked a fleeing for Christians. Uh, 100 years ago, they were 20% of the population, and now they are only 4%. Now, among them are Catholics, Orthodox, Armenians, and Lutherans. And uh, Katana, as we see, you know, this peace plan is definitely on the minds of several of, uh, several of today's leaders. We see some uh, people getting involved, like uh, Prince Williams, who hasn't uh, mentioned that, or we haven't seen him uh, be concerned with the peace plan in the past. Right. Of course, Jared Kushner um, has been actively involved, and some are saying that um, his inexperience with dealing with both sides might give him the advantage to actually finding uh, a, a peace plan, or I guess getting the peace plan active again, um, you know, for both sides that they both can agree with. So the peace plan, as we know, this is something that Yushua Hawkins has talked about for, for years on how important it is with the prophetic timeline and what events uh, are centered around the restarting of this peace plan. All right, and interestingly enough, uh, many people may not be very familiar with the history of it. Uh, some young people today may not have even been born when this took That's place, right. but they had that, that meeting and the signing on the White House lawn when President uh, Bill Clinton was in office uh, in September of 1993, which this particular peace plan, which uh, has been discussed many, many times before, actually was initiated or uh, uh, taken into effect October 13, 
1993. So it's been a long period of time since then up to where we are now because it was put on, on hold about three and a half years later right. uh, and 1997 by um, Benjamin Netanyahu. And so there's been a real struggle for the Palestinians and the Israelis to actually sit down and to negotiate the, 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 you know, uh, the, the reinstitution of this plan and the terms that was already agreed to. So it'll be nice to see how this progresses over the next few months since we have new players, so to speak, that are in the game. And although Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime, uh, the prime Minister of Israel, although he still uh, insists on not giving in and not wanting to restart that peace plan, we know that uh, through the teachings that Yisrael Hawkins has brought forth that that peace plan will be started mm -hmm. again. Right. It will be put back into action. That's so right. it's going to be really interesting to see how it, uh, it comes about and how they get it back in action again and, and to see the events that are centered around it. That's right. Well, to find out more about the peace plan, uh, how it was prophesied, and what the Holy Scriptures actually show how it is going to unfold, you can contact the House of Yahweh for more information. And when you do, don't forget to request your free copies of the monthly newsletter and the Prophetic Word magazine, Here's How. You can write the House of Yahweh by writing them at the House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas, 79604. You can also call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites by going to Yahweh.com, YisraelHawkins.com, or Yahweh'sBranch.com. You can also visit our website by going to YPNNews.com. You can also email the House of Yahweh by just sending them an email at info at Yahweh.com. And for all calls outside the United States, please dial the number on your screen. And of course, for those of you who are, who are uh, desirous to learn more about the Holy Scriptures and the prophecies therein, you can use one of the best and free uh, study resources on the Internet, the Yisrael Says and the Ask Yisrael program. And you can simply find them by merely typing in YisraelSays.com or AskYisrael.com. Well, don't go anywhere. Up next, another important message from Yisro Hawkins. Well, from all of us here at YPN News, I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. And I'm Katan Alexander. Thanks for watching.